On the 21st of December 1988, Pan Am Flight 103 from London to New York was scheduled to take off at 6 p.m. from Heathrow's Terminal 3. 259 people from 21 nations boarded the 747 the Clipper made of the seas. And then they waited. Almost half an hour late, the Clipper took off and headed north towards Scotland. It was a very quiet night. Um, traffic, as far as I was concerned, had died down. There was still a bit moving uh, below me in the lower air spaces. And I watched the clipper coming up over southern Scotland, and then suddenly the uh, his contact, radar contact disappears, and in its place uh, these uh, effectively what looked like Christmas lights. And the penny began to drop very fast and very heavily then. 103 Scottish, do you read me? Uh, Top tried to contact the pilot of the clipper repeatedly, but got no answer. When he double-checked with Oceanic Control, responsible for the plane's Atlantic crossing, they too had lost contact with the plane. Just before 7.03 p.m., the clipper's signal had appeared to disintegrate into five separate pieces. I watched these five pieces of wreckage uh, sort of just in that area. They didn't move, strangely enough, although outside uh, I knew it to be very windy. I mean, there was winds of about 100 miles an hour up at that level. And eventually these five main pieces disappeared out of my radar contact. And we all watched them in total silence as slowly they disappeared off the screen. Five miles below the clipper's last known position lay the small town of Lockerbie. Stormy weather had kept most of the town's people inside watching television. In Sherwood Crescent, the town's Catholic priest had just got back from bringing his mother home for Christmas. The main news came on at seven o'clock. I watched the highlights. And it suddenly dawned on me I should go upstairs and hide my mother's Christmas present because I'd accidentally left it in her bedroom upstairs. So she went through to the kitchen to make a cup of tea and I said, I'll just go upstairs for a minute. I took the present out of the cupboard, turned to put it in the bed and the first thing I heard was the sound of a, a wind. I was sitting at the fire opening Christmas cards when it was Cara that heard the noise first and I couldn't think what was wrong with her. Her hackles were up and she was growling and... and and then all of a sudden there's this terrible noise of, I didn't know what it was, but it sounded to me as if it was going to land on my house. And then the whole house started to vibrate, the pictures moving, the ornaments moving, and I wonder what was happening. All the lights went out, and it was the most enormous explosion, the most enormous explosion, and the whole house shook, and I could remember putting my hand over my head and looking at the ceiling. I didn't shut my eyes. I thought, this ceiling's coming in on me and I'm going to either die or I'll be badly injured. So I headed for the front door. When I looked out in the street, there was this brilliant orange light uh, and balls of fire falling on the street on the roofs. Right away we saw the 
firewall and flames rolling up from Lockerbie. It's about five miles from here to the actual crash site. And in the dark night sky, it was really terrifying to look at it. And we, we thought of a military plane and, and we're saying, we hope the man's got ejected. Never in the, entered our mind that it could be a passenger plane. So I opened the front door and I could not believe what I saw. The whole street had gone. It was just this enormous, enormous fire. I thought, this is big stuff, this is big. chaos that followed the fire in Lockerbie, no one yet knew that it was the fuel-laden wing section of a jumbo jet that had caused the explosion in Sherwood Crescent, which had sent a debris-filled fireball shooting 300 feet into the air. Even when it was known what had struck the town, it would take days to establish the death toll on the ground and to comprehend the full extent of the worst air disaster in British aviation history. I said to myself, this is big, because I knew I was into a situation which I'd never envisaged before. And I knew it was going to be big, it was going to be complicated, and it was going to be messy and really quite traumatic, not just at the time, but consequently down through the months and the years. As news of the disaster hit families who'd gone to New York's Kennedy Airport to welcome their loved ones home for Christmas, the reality of the tragedy began to dawn on relatives all over the world. one of the worst air disasters ever, and as this day begins, the cause remains a mystery. Officials do say there was a mid-air explosion, and this morning a group calling itself the Guardians of the Islamic Revolution claimed that it was responsible for that explosion. Devastated by the news that their loved ones had been murdered by terrorists, relatives heard that the crash might have been avoided if only a bomb threat had been taken seriously. The threat came two weeks ago when a caller to the U.S. Embassy in Helsinki said a Pan Am plane out of Frankfurt would be blown up. Many of the bereaved found this was the bitterest blow of all, making their loss even harder to bear. Ten years later, the suspects have still not come to trial. Relatives of the murdered victims, who fought doggedly to get justice for them, feel betrayed by such a failure. They get scant comfort from the fact that Pan Am has since gone out of business, leaving its landmark building to the insurance giant MetLife. Michelle Chula was only 17 when her father Frank was killed on Flight 103. I remember that day moment to moment. I mean, it's as if it happened yesterday. That day changed my life forever. When the crash first happened, the only thing I could concentrate on was my father being gone and the loss that we felt under our roof. I didn't want to deal with the other 269 people. I didn't want to deal with the whole plane crash aspect. I just could not understand it, and I could not deal with it. As the years went on, I personally became curious about the other parts of it, and I think that I'm finally beginning to piece it all together and I think now I'm ready to really understand the whole um, spectrum of what happened and I think that I could never have said that five years ago you know whether it was my age or just I was too busy dealing with my father's death
It's almost as if I wanted an opportunity to put these 10 years in one place. I walked into my house and, and my mom was on the floor and my sister was above her and she had her winter coat still on so my mom my sister must have just gotten home when she called me and my mom was just sobbing and she was just yelling my father's name and I just couldn't believe this was going on I didn't understand this couldn't be happening you know he was gonna be home for dinner and it's so strange because I, I walked into the den, which is right in front of the front door, and I prayed. And I used to pray every single night. And I prayed that this wasn't happening. And I didn't pray for me or my sister or my brother, but I just looked at my mother and I said, she can't handle this. There's no way. The only thing that I feel um, bad about is, you know, like Anna and Ray and all the people that won't go. I felt um, so hurt and such pain that I couldn't feel for anybody else. Uh, I couldn't even feel for my kids a lot in a lot of ways at the beginning. Um, they had each other. And I really think because they had each other, they were okay, but I had nobody. So it was just me alone fighting this whole thing. He was, he was a good guy. He just was loving, caring. Um, he was a great dad, great husband, and he was my best friend. I mean, I, could, I talked everything out with him. Even if it was the stupidest thing, he would understand. I mean, he was such a kind person that for this to happen to him because somebody hated, we don't live by hate in this family at all. So it was very hard like, to accept the fact that he was murdered in such a way because somebody hated it. We had a choice and uh, we all knew that at the time and we had a choice of either letting it tear us apart or bringing us closer together. So I really chose to go into my family. Um, I didn't want that anger. That's not me, that wasn't my kid, that wasn't my husband. While Michelle's older brother and sister coped with the loss in their own way, the whole family felt horror for the place and the way in which Frank had died. I remember watching the news and I remember seeing flames. That's my most vim vivid image that I come up with when I think about the news footage. I remember seeing flames and the first thing we had heard was perhaps a jet had crashed into a petrol station. That's what we had heard. And that was nauseating to me. Obviously difficult enough to just deal with the loss of, of our father and, and what that meant. But after that, and actually finding out that, that someone had purposefully placed a bomb on board to, to kill all these people, it was, it, it was, it was just uncomprehendable at the, at the time. I, we just couldn't understand what, how, how someone could do that and, and the anger and, and, and pain that already existed just magnified. While many relatives expressed their anger by lobbying Washington for justice and revenge, the Chulas withdrew into the world of their own home. They did, however, make close friendships with other bereaved relatives who live nearby. One of them who lost not only her husband, but her son and pregnant daughter too, is Jerry Buser. But unlike the Chula family, she was keen to visit Lockerbie right from the start. I think Jerry Buser has to be one of the strongest women that I've ever met simply because her grief is so unexplainable. I mean, losing her husband and her daughter and her son in one fell swoop is, is beyond comprehension to me. And I look at her and there are times where I'm afraid to hug her because I'm afraid she's gonna break because she's just been through so much. Jerry tried to encourage the Chulas to join her on a trip to Lockerbie, but without success. I just couldn't go and my son wanted to go and I stopped him from going because I couldn't handle him being on a plane at this point. And he kind of understood. 
my mother didn't want me to go. And she said it uh, flat out, right at the beginning. Uh, I didn't question it, I honored that immediately. Fearful of the details they might learn of Frank's fate, the Chulas avoided Lockerbie for almost four years. In our mind, we saw the wreckage, we saw the flames, we saw the crater and the cockpit. And this is, in our imagination, where my father was and where he spent his last hours. But ten years on, Michelle has become curious to know the very facts that once filled her with the utmost horror. To try and come to terms with the tragedy, she's decided to write a book as a memorial to her father's life and the way he died. She now wants to confront the enormity of the disaster, to understand its effect on other relatives, and most of all, on the people of Lockerbie itself. I think of the other daughters who lost their fathers, and of all the parents who lost their children. I think of the families on the ground, looking forward to Christmas with their families, when fire, death, and horror rain down on them. But now, I want to know more. I need to understand the full scale of the tragedy that took my father from me and changed so many lives forever. I think part of me feels bad that I didn't think about them. Part of me feels that I should have, that I should have acknowledged what they were going through when they were going through it. But I guess when you're going through so much pain, it's difficult to recognize what's outside of you. You're just dealing with what is inside of you every day and what's going on with your mother and your sister and your brother. I mean, it might sound strange, but I want to go there and almost apologize for not going before this. Getting the courage to go to Lockerbie now is the first step on Michelle's journey of discovery. Although she has been there briefly with her mother before, She's never spent enough time there to really understand the effect of the disaster on the people themselves. How many of you ask? Uh, there's... About 10, 20? No. How many? Apprehensive about the disturbing facts she may uncover on this trip, Michelle has asked her brother Frank to go with her to lend support and perhaps to quell her fears. There are times when I fly that I'm fine. And there are times when I fly that I am filled with fear. This trip over was really hard for me because of the reason that I was coming. But there are times when I fly that I think a lot about my father and I think about what he was doing. And I look around at the people on the plane and I think to myself, they're not scared. They don't think anything's gonna happen. They're just doing their thing. And I think that's exactly what those passengers were doing. And I envy the people that can get on a plane and can sit down and make themselves comfortable. And their biggest worry is if they've, you know, have their special meal waiting for them. For 10 years, Michelle has avoided making this type of journey to Lockerbie. But having arrived, it's important to be sure she can face the details. She is about to learn the things that only a handful of relatives ever witnessed in the days immediately after the crash. I think that I'm ready to face details. I think that I wasn't before now. I don't know what the details are, which is the only apprehension that I have, because I can say, I'll be fine, I'll understand things, I've read enough, I've talked to enough people, but I don't know what to expect. It's quite different without my mom because for the first time I'm in Lockerbie for me. And for the first time my eyes are wide open. It's hard to imagine what it was like on the night of December 21st as I walk through the streets now because everything seems so normal. Everyone's just going about their business and doing their own thing.
to truly understand what happened, I came up with a list of people that I wanted to meet, people who had been there the night of the crash. I started with a radio journalist who was one of the first people on the scene that night. He was at Sherwood Crescent, one of the worst affected areas of town. And this is the first night? This is the, the first piece from, from Lockerbie, from the flyover. I'm standing at the moment on a flyover which crosses the A74 Carlisle to Glasgow dual carriageway. The road is totally closed. Behind me, the traffic is queued as far back as you can see on the southbound lane. There's nothing at all except emergency vehicles on the northbound lane. Over to my left, just beside the, the carriageway, a number of buildings are still ablaze. It looks to me from here as if uh, about four, five, maybe half a dozen houses and possibly are on fire, almost totally gutted, and they're only a few yards from the roadway. They'll be maybe 400 yards from where I'm standing. All over the town, there's a pall of smoke. It, uh, it's thick down in the town centre area. You can only see about 50 to 70 yards, and the smell of burning is in the air. The debris from the plane... Willie Johnson's report was really strong, but I was not ready for what I heard from the emergency workers and the townspeople themselves. As I went down the main street, the road was littered with soil and stones, and uh, I would see even pieces of people at... Uh, which I didn't recognise at that particular time. I had a flash lamp, but it wasn't too strong. And when I saw the clothing, I thought it was a local girl had been knocked down by the, the debris, and she may have been unconscious. But when we turned her over, she was a Negro. The fuel-filled wings had exploded on impact with Sherwood Crescent, vaporising houses and people on the edge of the A74 motorway. Elsewhere, houses narrowly escaped demolition by one of the plane's engines. It was just a, an inferno. There was houses on fire, hedges, trees on fire, and down into the bottom end of Sherwood Crescent. The houses I'd been in that area had completely disappeared, and I could remember seeing a wrought iron gate actually melting in front of my eyes and uh, I saw it next day and it was a beautiful blue molted pool of metal just like lava flow. The uh, pavements were on fire as the gas pipes had burst and that the, the, gas, the, the gas was burning up through the, the footpaths. And uh, there was windows popping and houses further back. And the one thing that sticks in my mind was a fireman standing there with a hose and no water coming out of it. Another engine had severed part of the town's water supply. Empty milk tankers had to be pressed into service to bring water to fight the blaze. One point through this thick smoke, I came upon this couple who were walking quite calmly through it all and almost as a Sunday stroll. And, and they stopped me and they asked me what service I was from and I was so confused at the time, still at the height of my emotions, I couldn't remember which service I was with. It took me a few moments to remember I was actually with the fire service. Confused emergency workers gazed in horror at the infernal crater where once three houses had stood. In the absence of facts, they could only speculate on the number of casualties suffered by people on the ground. The carnage suggested hundreds must be dead, but in fact 11 from Lockerbie had died, along with all on board the plane. Town Hall. Ambulances have come from towns throughout the area and uh, from Carlisle to get uh, the, the injured away from the scene as quickly as possible. I think the assumption at the beginning was that there must be an awful lot of casualties, an awful lot of walking wounded. Uh, doctors, nurses, staff had been called in from their rest pe uh, periods. A lot of members of the public had turned up as well to give blood in, in, on the assumption that uh, a lot of blood would be required. And one of the, the saddest things was that there was just no one there to treat. I think only about two or three people from Lockerbie required hospital treatment uh, and there was no one from the plane. The emergency services were trying to get a handle on themselves on what was happening just as we were. I had no idea at that stage that there were crash sites all over Lockerbie. 
when the cockpit of a jumbo jet was found in a field at Tundergarth, three miles out of Lockerbie, the hideous scale of the disaster at last became apparent to rescue workers searching for survivors. Inside the cockpit, stripped naked by the force of decompression, were the captain and crew. The first bodies uh, that I saw were actually about 9.30 in the evening when I went up to Tundergarth, and uh, there was obviously the, the crew inside the cockpit and one or two around about. I think it was when I returned in daylight and that really brought home to you the, the level, the number of people that were involved in, in the accident itself. Um, and I suppose that the enormity really struck you then. Suspicion about the cause of the crash meant each body was the subject of criminal investigation. Orders were given to leave them where they lay until police could document every single death. But for many relatives, far from the place where their loved ones had fallen, their minds often conjured up a spectacle that was even worse. Your imagination takes over and you just imagine him sitting outside by himself in the dark, in the cold, for days and days and days. And that has always been kind of a journey that I've never wanted to face. But nearly four years after the crash, that was the very journey that Michelle's mother finally insisted she make with her. When we discovered that my father was found on Minska Farm, that was news to us. And when we discovered that there was an opportunity for us to meet the people that found him, that was news to us. We had no idea that these people existed. It never even entered our mind that there were people that saw him that night. It never entered our mind. As far as we knew, he was found on Tundergarth. The story that awaited Michelle of the circumstances surrounding her father's fall to earth was a strange one. It began nearly six miles from the flaming crater in Lockerbie on Hugh and Margaret Connell's remote hill farm. And at that time we were completely unaware that things were crashing down round about us. Even though we could hear noises, we thought they were coming from the crash site. And it took quite a while for the wreckage to land here. We have to, it's easy looking back, we know now it was floating down from five miles up in the sky. So it was, there was a delay of two or three minutes from the time the flames were boiling up in Lockerbie till things were crashing down here. And we weren't aware of and the land, but then our electric went out. Venturing outside to investigate, Mr. Connell stumbled upon a totally unexpected object lying on a road near the farm. We come on the mail bag on the road and then realised that there was wreckage lying around us. And then we started wandering over the fields and, and finding first suitcases and Parts seats and parts of the plane. It was then we realised it was a passenger plane because initially we thought of a military plane. Um, Huey says, um, do you know what has really happened? That it's been a passenger aircraft and we've found two passengers dead on the place. Worried that there might be wounded survivors lying somewhere on the outlying fields of their farm, the Connells began a thorough search of the area. In the darkness, we just had to look further. Because at the time, we always felt there could be survivors, there could be somebody out there injured. There was no way we could settle, just sit in the house and wonder. Even after many hours spent searching the dark hills, they had found only two bodies, one a few hundred yards from the house, the other over a mile away. Both the bodies we found were, they were just, they just had fell there. There was nothing to indicate they were seriously injured. They just, life was gone, but they were whole intact. Others near the locker, we would have far more horror than we had. We found limbs and body parts, but we never had the horror that some knew. And it just had, but it was the, the remoteness and the loneliness that, as we had to search on our own, that really seemed to get to us.
When dawn finally came, the Connells were greeted by a bizarre and disturbing sight. For the first time, they could see the hundreds of personal items from the front cargo hold that had been scattered over their land. And in a brown passenger seat, a short walk from their house, sat Michelle's father, Frank. It was just unbelievable. You just couldn't think that there was a fellow man, a human being, um, in a field, in a passenger seat, in a plane seat. It's hard to believe. These kind of things just happen elsewhere, you know. It's now six years since Michelle took her first reluctant steps towards the Connells' farm to learn the story that was to transform her whole outlook on Lockerbie and its people. I thought it was absolutely disgusting to have an opportunity to talk to these people. I couldn't relate to it. I didn't want anything to do with it. And I was so sad that, that we might find out stuff that we didn't want to know. I just wanted to be anywhere but there. And I swore that I wouldn't say anything to them, and I swore that there were no questions that I wanted answered, and I swore that I would just leave and never see them again. Hi. Hello, Morgan. How are you? Oh, great. It's such a beautiful day out to visit. This time, however, Michelle can hardly wait to see the people who found her father, and who she now knows treated him with such love and respect. Like other relatives, the Chulas have found that the tragic circumstances under which they first met the Connells has since brought them close together. Michelle, of course, it was quite a thing for her. She was going to do no talking whatsoever. She didn't want to come to Lockerbie. It was a horrible place, but her mum had persuaded her and uh, Frank. And, uh, oh, it was, there was no mistake. And as soon as they stepped out of the car and we saw them, they were just so like him, you see. And uh, I just said to her, I said, you're just so like your dad. You know, I had 10 years of healing in that one moment. It was, it was amazing. It was like, oh, she saw my father. You I mean, he was okay. And, and I think the thing that really turned things around for my mom was knowing that they found him 20 minutes after the crash. This is the local, this is the army. From the moment they found him, the Connells had wanted to contact the relatives of the man who'd come to them so strangely in the night. They hoped to offer the comfort of explaining exactly what had happened. But at first, they didn't even know his name. We just called him our boy for a long time because we didn't know his name. We didn't find out what, what he was called for about maybe five or six months after before we found out his name was... Frank and his age. They did not have to pay any attention to my family, and yet they've embraced us, and they've fallen in love with us as we have fallen in love with them, and we continue to establish a really strong relationship, and I'm happy to have the opportunity to walk the fields, and I'm happy to have an opportunity to, to stand in that spot that my father was found. Someone we'd never known or never met in the flesh, and even to shed so many tears for for his family and for his relations. But it, for some reason, our whole grief seemed to work towards Frank, and he he became the focus of our thoughts. And it, it was great that we could have that feeling for him, that that love for him. Where the tree stands is a very sacred place for me, for my sister, for my mom, for my brother. And it's a very sacred place for them. And they take such good care of it. And it's just so nice to have that. It would be hard to believe what it was like that night, you know, in the darkness. Yeah, in the darkness and uh -huh. the, so many, 
so much doubts and unknowns in our mind. We just didn't know what was happening, you know. Yeah. They're coming on here, he didn't know. We just wondered, what do we do next, you know, mm -hmm. where can yeah. we go? And then when we went back to the house to try and phone, the phones were jammed, there was no, we couldn't contact anybody. Yeah. And we knew by then that because of the, what had happened at around Lockerbie and that, that it would be quite a while before anybody would come. Right. And we finally contacted the police, but it was one o'clock in the morning before they, they got out to the, out here. So this, Frank was the furthest away from the crash site. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how, I mean, I think that I know, I can remember this, but I don't, re I don't remember how long he was here. Was it for, how many days before they lifted the oh, body? No, uh, just the next, next day. Afternoon. Yeah. Was it? Next yeah. afternoon, yeah. But it, it probably wouldn't be, it wouldn't have been registered at Lockerbie for a, a day or two, day. possibly. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. You know, although he was collected from here, uh -huh. yeah, they were, they were just swamped with bodies in, yeah. you know, at oh. the time. And they tried to I mean, it wasn't just they that they found my father that night. It was someone had to take him oh, to somewhere, and the, eventually he had to get home. And all these steps were taken with such love and with such care. You know, meeting Hugh and Margaret, I was like, these are the most extraordinary people in the world. And I realized that they are, but so is everyone else that did something during the crash and, and helped these relatives get through their pain. It really is just phenomenal to think about how much care went into taking care of our relatives. Rosebank Crescent, where the fuselage deposited more than 60 bodies, most people dealt with their own trauma by helping others. Maxwell Kerr was one of them. Maybe it's because Jerry Buser's husband and daughter were found at Rosebank Crescent that I was really curious as to what it was like for the townspeople that lived there. I wanted to know what it was like for people to walk out of their homes and see bodies in their gardens. I wanted to know how they managed and what effect it had on them. Uh, right throughout the gardens here, from the trees here, right down to the very bottom, and there's quite a bit of debris in there. The most of the debris was lying in here. And so these houses were fine then? They were f the, the houses, the actual windows and the doors were blown in. One of my friends in his back garden, he said that there were 21 or 24 victims in his back garden. But he's, he's, he was an old soldier, actually. He'd been in the Chindits during the war in Burma. And I said, uh, Bob Edgar was his name, I said, Bob, you wouldn't like to move, would you? Uh, we'd get you rehoused. He says, no, no, not at all, not at all. He says, I'm fine where I am. He says, uh, I've seen some bad things Marmy service, so this is it is bad, but uh, it's nothing to worry about. So he just stayed put, and he wouldn't move. Like that was him. My nephew had been driving up uh, Rosebank Crescent Park Place with his car, and he ran across some of the debris on the road on the way past, and he actually thought he'd run over some bodies, which really it did affect him uh, to get the doctor. Actually, uh, he's all right now. He's, he's smashing. He's married now, and he's got a family. But at that time, it was the trauma of that. He couldn't believe. And he had to be reassured that there was nobody on the road, and then there was. The people of Lockerbie dealt with the crash as if they had had a book that said, if a plane crashes on your town, this is what you need to do. They dealt with it with love and with compassion. They never stopped taking care of the relatives. They never stopped taking care of each other. It was extraordinary to hear the stories and to see how they were able to put their lives back together slowly but surely. For weeks, the townspeople were inundated with relatives, with press, with policemen, with rescue workers. What struck me the most was how the people of Lockerbie used their own pain and their own grief to help others. That was how they dealt with it. It's amazing to know that although they were all suffering themselves, they were able to turn that suffering around for the good of the town and for the good of the relatives. What is so incredible is that there is not one person in Lockerbie that thinks they did anything special. In the rebuilt Sherwood Crescent, where he narrowly escaped death himself, lived one of the many people who've tried so hard to comfort relatives of the 270 dead. 
When the explosion happened here, Father Patrick Keegans had only just arrived in town as its new Catholic priest. I came to Loggerbay in um, January of 1988, but at that time I wasn't well. I'd been suffering that time from alcoholism. So my life it was really a disaster in itself. In fact, I wanted to die at that time. I was suicidal at that point. I, rec I recognised that um, I would be better off dead and that everyone else would be better off without me in this world. That's what I really believed. And it was true at the time. But when I met all the people of Lockerbell, I loved them from the start. I thought, I really like these people. And that was a sort of push. It gave me a sort of push because I didn't want to mess up their lives again the way I'd messed up other people's lives through my, my alcoholism or drinking. Sam saw the hand of fate in the fact that the man who'd saved himself from a self-inflicted death was one of the few inhabitants of Sherwood Crescent whose house remained intact. Father Keegan's and his mother were saved from death when they delayed a visit to friends whose house was destroyed by the blast. For the past ten years, Father Keegan's has devoted himself to helping bereaved families on visits to the town, just as he helped the Chulas on their first trip. Very good to see you. Ah, well, are you coming in? Yes, yes I am. <laughs> That's last, okay. The last thing you're here, you brought cream cakes. Oh. Where are the cream cakes? <laughs> I'm sorry, we didn't bring oh. any. He was also the first resident of Sherwood Crescent to move back into his house, even though the roof was still under a tarpaulin. I really wanted to, to be here. I mean, it sounds crazy to come back in a way. But I thought, I'm going to show the people that it's possible to live here, no matter what the mess is, and that even by living in the mess, this is the start of us getting better. Also, having gone through that painful experience of being alcoholic and being at the point where I thought life wasn't worth living, I knew what people who had lost family were feeling. There was a similar type of feeling. There was a feeling, you know, God, life has come to an end for me because my husband has died or my children have died. The motorway runs right along here, mm -hmm. north-south, and it was this um, southbound carriageway. It was actually on fire, really on fire, and the cars were in there. I thought, my God, if there are people in those cars, they're dead. Fortunately, they weren't. They'd right. actually get out. But then I thought to myself, that's very, very close to where Morris and Dora Henry live. That is close. At that point, I did not know what was in the Crescent, no. No. I still imagine, you know, it's a bit further beyond. It's on the motorway that this crash has happened. I wasn't aware of what was outside the front door. You know, coming here the first time and coming back and hearing, really trying to understand what it was like when you walked out of your house and you saw this devastation, I think that it was the right decision for my family not to come. I think that it would have been too much, it would have been too hard, and we would never have had the time to heal before finding these answers. One of several spiritual centres created by the people of Lockerbie for relatives to pay their respects and to mourn is the cemetery at Drivesdale. Few of the bereaved ever visit the town without coming here to spend a quiet moment in the place that was built and dedicated within a year of the disaster. One of the very first relatives to arrive in Lockerbie after the crash was Joe Hogan, who came on a self-imposed mission to find the body of his brother-in-law, Mike. In the process, he built up a close relationship with many people in Lockerbie, among them Father Keegan's, who believes Michelle will learn a lot from the experiences Joe went through here. Michelle, Joanne, Joe Hogan, and brother Frank, Joe Hogan. Were you here when this was dedicated? Yes. You were? Yes. Remember? Yes, I remember. <laughs> well. We were just talking about that because yeah. I'm still amazed that it was able to be done in, in the year's time. Oh, and the, we were standing there after the ceremony was over, and this woman came up to me, and she just placed this envelope against my chest and just took off. Mm -hmm. I never caught her. And I opened it up, and it's a ceramic plaque, and it has uh, the Statue of Liberty and, the, and uh -huh. the flag of St. Andrews, and it says, United We Stand. 
Yeah, we met with someone who said so eloquently that she lost 270 people. Yeah. And I never it's, thought of it that way, right. you know. It's, it's like I lost one person, yeah. but the town lost 270 yeah. people. They lost 270 people and what they had to deal with here. Um, I think one of the best opportunities of this trip was talking with Joe Horgan. Because we didn't come right away, because we didn't want to. And I imagine that if it was my mother that was flying home, and if my father was the one that had survived, that he would have acted as Joe did. And he would have gotten on a plane, and he would have demanded to know what happened. They took the flight deck apart today in the search for an answer to what caused the explosive rupture from the fuselage, and to take the crew away. They brought the police and firemen close round and put up a tarpaulin as they cut through to the cockpit. They took the captain away first and then the co-pilot. Driven by a single-minded determination to find his brother-in-law's body, Joe Horgan ignored police cordons and visited every crash site in Lockerbie, in the hope of finding Mike's remains. Each search mission yielded more and yet more bodies, but there was still no sign of Mike. To be discreet, rescue workers rushed the bodies into the center of town, where the town hall had been set aside as a temporary mortuary. As the days went by, Joe Horgan witnessed increasingly gruesome details of the recovery operation. I did things here that I never want to do again, and I saw things that I never want to see again. Um, but I mean, it was chaos. You know, it, it, it was, there was just total devastation, so I was able to, to get everywhere. And I didn't speak, so no one knew who I was. They didn't know I was a relative. So I was able to get to every one of the sites. Um, you know, I looked like a searcher you know, the way I was dressed, and I just kind of acted like I belonged there. And then when I came back, they were quite upset, and uh -huh. they didn't know what to do with me. And I, I just said, well, I didn't come over here to sit around. I said, I'm going to, you know, I can help, I can do something. I said, but I can't sit here. In the event, Joe spent much of his time in the incident control center, where police were coordinating the search and rescue effort of an area which they now realized was spread over 850 square miles. To understand what it was like for the searchers, Michelle arranged to meet the volunteers who undertook the grim job on the ground. It's the first time they've been back since the night of the crash. Do you remember how far you went that night? You walked. These hills. Yeah, we walked right up through all these all these fields. It all looks different just now, actually. But we did walk up through all the fields. We did what we call a line search. almost moonlight and so it, that made it a bit easier you could actually just be in the field and we'd look over and we'd see shapes you know in the field so we knew that when we get into that field we knew that we would, that we would come upon bodies but, uh, that was uh, what we had to do there were three bodies still over there and they had only enough sticks to, to mark two of them and uh, unfortunately I found myself the only one with a stick left and uh, so I, I went across on, on my own. I, f I saw the, the three bodies and I saw the one that wasn't marked and uh, I went to put a stick beside it and um, it kept falling down, it kept kneeling like close to her, her face and she was, she was really unmarked, you know, there was a number of the bodies who were, were marked, you know. But she was completely unmarked, and she she just looked uh, as if she was sleeping, you know. And um, she did remind me greatly of my daughter, so that was a wee bit hard. The, the, and some of the other ones, the, the things that we found, I suppose, they were so grotesque that um, I couldn't really believe I'd seen it. So I forgot the Uh She kept coming back into my mind all the time, um, and affected me quite a bit. 
it was actually, if this is a strange way to put it, but one of the highlights of this trip to actually walk the fields that the rescue people were walking that night. It was really, it took me, it was surreal. It took me back then. It was as if I was there. And it just puts on such a personal touch on the whole thing, you know, because these people were finding Christmas presents and they were suffering and they were taking down their Christmas lights and they too had grieving to do. They too were mourning these people. And both Colin and Jim, you know, telling their own stories in their own way, again, made it come to light to me in that way. Is it strange for you to be here now? It is really strange. This is the first time I've been back since the event. And uh, it comes back to you. I mean, I can now sort of half close my yeah. eyes and visualize the light, the helicopter, the noise, the sound of policemen coming towards us up the track. It comes back to you quite quickly, actually. We came across parts of bodies, we came across whole bodies and, you know, we saw some, some dreadful things um, which do come back to you sometimes, you know. Um, I, I, I think we always get flashbacks, you know. I remember a, a year afterwards, or just afterwards, I went to a burn supper. People have not been to a burn supper, but when they cut open the haggis, I had to leave the room. I had to get out of the room there and then, because it just all flashed back. But time healed that. So, how long were you actually out searching and, and marking bodies? And we worked right through to Christmas Day, the night of Christmas Day, so we missed Christmas Day completely. The second day we were asked to search the golf, the wood downstream, downwind of the golf course, where many bodies have been found as well. And we were really worried there were bodies in the trees. And I remember that day, people went completely so silent. Young, some of the younger yeah. ones, were, the worry was that a body would fall mm -hmm. from the tree. You could see the reaction. Yeah. Because we're youngsters there. Yeah. 17, so we, we, said, we said to them, talk to, let's talk to each other, guys. Let's not walk in silence. So we talked a lot and whistled. So we knew you weren't on your own. And in fact, there was nothing there at all. And then the next day, we searched a mountain area further north from here. And up to then, nothing actually got through to me because I think I had the team pressure on me. But that day, I was on my own on the hill. And it was luggage <coughs> we came across. And I always remember coming across a Christmas parcel and I had Dumbo the elephant in it. And Dumbo's ears were flapping in the wind. And I cracked up. Mm. I absolutely cracked up. Because, you know, I've got children, you know, so uh, that mattered that day, you know. It's just so personal and so real. I mean, everyone felt something and everyone has a moment that they realize what was really going on. They realize who these people were. They understood the magnitude of this event. And it's those moments that I think are the most interesting to hear because they're so different for each person. Not every relative, however, uncovered facts about the fate of their loved ones as comforting as those found by Michelle. In Rosebank Crescent, where a major portion of the fuselage fell, more than 60 bodies rained down on roofs and gardens. The horror of this spectacle was one of the reasons police press officer Angus Kennedy advised relatives not to come to Lockerbie. People react differently, uh, and if relatives do want to come on, if that if they find comfort in coming on, then we are geared with the social work department to help and assist them further when they arrive in Lockerbie. But you advise them to the American authorities? Our, our, our advice to them, if, if at all possible, now is not the time to come to Lockerbie. Kennedy, however, struck a special deal with Joe Horgan. In return for his agreement to speak to the world's press on behalf of the relatives, he would be permitted to stay in the police control centre until Mike's body was finally identified. You run quite a gambit of emotions. You know, grief, loss, um, frustration, anger. As the mound of floral tributes continued to rise outside the town hall, the number of coffins grew inside. It was six days before Joe at last received word that his brother-in-law's body had been found in the Rosebank Crescent area. And Joe said to me, would you come and say a prayer over the coffin? And we approached the big hall, the main hall upstairs, and the doors, we opened the doors, and inside there were rows and rows of coffins. Just file upon file of coffins. It was very shocking to see. I'd heard so much about the town hall. Walking into that room that the coffins had been laid out was so hard for me. 
I had seen that picture so many times on the news, just those pine boxes in a row. I think talking to Joe and, and walking around the town hall and into that room it was one step closer to really knowing what happened and what it was like in the town at that time. This way, and Mike was up here. And as we entered the hall, we walked up into here, and there were five dignitaries up at the front, um, I guess, viewing the caskets. And when they saw us, they stopped immediately what they were doing and just walked right by us and said, we will leave you with the peace you deserve, and they left the room. And immediately they came forward, passed all these rows of coffins, they came up to us, shook Joe's hand, shook my hand and said, we'll leave you. We'll leave you with the peace which you deserve. which I found very touching. You know, there was a real mark of respect, not just to those who had died, but to, to Joe and myself, you know. So Joe and I, we went along the line of coffins, and God, we're hanging on to each other like grim death, you know, just for support, just holding on to each other. And I just said, said the prayers for the dead, and then we came away. This was quite emotional because it was, uh, you know, after six days of, you know, trying to find Mike, you know, was, I finally got next to him. So it was, uh, this was very emotional. But it was, uh, it was uh, a different scene. You come in here and see all the caskets. Having forged such a close personal bond with press officer Angus Kennedy, Joe wanted to take Michelle out to the remote island of Col to meet the retired superintendent who'd played such a key role in explaining the Lockerbie story to the world's press. It's been very special for, for me to come across this time to um, in some small way help Michelle with her journey to uh, try and understand what took place here. To be able to see Angus and Fiona again and to come to the Isle of Call, which is something that Angus and I have spoken about for many, many years, and here we are, ten years later. And uh, um, the bond and the love that Angus and I have for one another is, um, you know, born out of an incredible tragedy. Um, we sometimes say, uh, you know, we wish we never met, but I can't imagine living my life without having Angus as a friend or ever knowing him. I really wanted to meet Angus Kennedy because of his crucial role as press officer. He had a really difficult job because he needed to balance the right of the relatives to get information, the desire of the press to get this information, and the fact that he was dealing with a criminal investigation. So therefore, some of the facts had to be restricted. He still managed to handle everything with sensitivity and tact. Kennedy even helped organize a police trip to America to give relatives information that he hoped might alleviate their suffering. You still remember. Uh, you still have flashbacks. It's small, insignificant things in themselves trigger off a memory or an image. But um, I think above all else, uh, in the peace and quiet up here, you, you've time to reflect and you can think of uh, the terrible trauma that people went through uh, and are still, I'm sure, going through. What kind of information did you bring over to help the relatives? Well, we brought uh, photographs um, uh, uh, of all descriptions. Uh, we brought catalogues of property. Uh, and one thing in particular uh, that we uh, brought was a, a huge map rolled up of the 850 square miles of the overall crash site. And on it, uh, we had marked each individual person where they were found. 
And one of the things that um, will stay with me always was having spoken with uh, some relatives and, and talked about their particular person and where they were found. I turned to speak to someone else and when I looked back they were touching the map on the spot and it was so such a poignant moment because here they were in New York and, and, and they were reaching out uh, to, to, to a map uh, and, and that, for me, spelt um, part of this need to, um, uh, to, to, to get there. Uh, it's the same sort of thing of, of going to Lockerbie, what it actually means to the individual to go. Uh, I, I mean, I stood in the main street of Lockerbie and said um, uh, on national television, um, now is not the time to come to Lockerbie um, uh, for relatives coming looking for information. Uh, our reaction, I think, uh, in retrospect, was wrong. Angus Kennedy's regret at having discouraged relatives from coming to Lockerbie was a recognition of the healing solace and compassion that so many relatives have since found in the town. And on her second week in the place, Michelle began to feel it too. I lost all faith in humanity when this crash happened. And it wasn't until I came to Lockerbie and I met the people that I realized their compassion and their kindness. And through meeting them, I was able to restore that faith that I had lost. Because Michelle's family had been so horrified by the thought of what had happened to Frank, they hadn't wanted to receive his personal belongings back. But for some relatives, the retrieval of those few precious items became a crucial part of the mourning process. What Michelle's family did not know was that in Lockerbie, police had spent more than three years meticulously gathering and identifying more than 20,000 items of personal property in a vast, disused warehouse. Thanks for spending some time with me. It's strange to be here. I've heard a lot about this place. Yes, it's got a lot of stories. And to know that this whole entire place was filled is kind of overwhelming. We had lorry loads of stuff coming in here. Suitcases, passports, Every, every sort of thing that you could imagine. So how many items were actually brought in and how many were actually given out? I, Approximately 20,000 items would come in here, personal items, and I would say about 75% would go back to the rightful owner. There was a lot of property in here that had got affected by rain, and you had this sort of smell in here, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like the smell of death mm -hmm. in here. And in particular, in the very early days, we were finding um, children's milk bottles, you know, that obviously could have been just being used before the explosion. One day, uh, uh, a German film crew came in, and when they seen what we were, had in here, and the way we were going about it, they actually said they'd never seen anything like this uh, since the Holocaust. But how did, I mean, I had no idea what my dad had. I have no idea what he was wearing. I had no idea what he would have packed. No idea. I mean, how did people know, especially the people that were gone for an entire semester at school? They had bought new clothing. They had bought presents and, and I guess, gifts from different countries. I mean, how could they piece that stuff together? Well, we, we had to read all written materials. A lot of these students, the students in particular, kept journals. And of course, we had read all these journals of where they had visited in Europe, in London, all over. 
by studying the profiles, going through their personal property, we were able to build up a picture of each individual. And in fact, when the relatives, uh, the next of kin came over, they were absolutely astounded at what we knew. We developed all the film found on the aircraft. And like, if you've got a dozen students visiting all the capital cities in Europe, and one's taking a photograph of the other, 11. You can identify clothing, mm -hmm. you can identify jewellery, uh, all sorts of things. Even bags that they're carrying, rucksacks. We even had one boy, student, who had taken a photograph of himself in a mirror. And from the reflection in the mirror, we were able to identify his camera, his tripod, and various items that were lying on the bed. Another of the countless acts of kindness offered by the people of Lockerbie to the strangers who landed in their midst was the dedication shown by volunteers who cleaned suitcases, polished shoes and laundered all the clothing of the dead victims. I heard about the women who washed and rewashed and ironed 11,000 articles of clothing for an entire year after the crash so that the victims' families could have their clothing back. I wanted to meet these women and understand what drove them and how they managed to keep on going. Hi. Hello, Michelle. How Welcome are you? you? Come in. Nice to meet you. Um, for me and my family, we received my father's um, bags back, mm -hmm. but we chose not to receive um, the clothes back because we were told that a lot of the clothes were in really bad condition. Mm -hmm. um, what, what condition were they in? I mean, was that a difficult part of it? Some of them were in very bad condition, but a lot of the clothes were in perfect condition. My biggest problem, I think, was the toothpaste, wasn't it, Myra? Yes. Of course, every suitcase contains a, a toilet bag. Mm -hmm. So we had to open all these toilet bags and take everything out, because it all had to be washed and cleaned. But the toothpaste tubes had all exploded. So you can imagine this gooey mess that we were taking out. And it was every toilet bag, I think, was like that, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. There was lots of tears at times with different people. And if you found something that upset you, well, personally, I would just go away and do my little thing. And I'd come back and something may be said between Elm and I or someone else, and we would have a laugh. And that got us through that particular item. Do you think in some ways it was therapeutic for you to be involved and yes, being able to definitely. do something? Definitely. Yes. Because yeah. everybody felt so helpless at that time when it happened and everybody wanted to do something, whether it was just a small thing, as they say, they asked for people to bake and they said within the week they had every freezer full that, you know, and it was all ages could become involved at that. You know what I mean? The sort of, an old lady sitting at home think, oh gosh, there must be something I can do to help these people. And they said, well, can you bake? So there may be a wee batch of scones and that was sent down for the men when they came in off the hills and the, the search and rescue men. And, and they felt wonderful because they'd done something. This is it. It was the helplessness, I think, Moira, isn't it? At, well, the, at the start. At the beginning, we're all so because helpless, we didn't know weren't what we? And when you did open a case or whatever, you wondered, it was private. You hadn't a right to go through it, and you had to pick up every article, no matter how small or whatever it was or what condition it was. But at the same time, you thought, well, it's not my family's, it's not mine to work with. Am I intruding by doing this? And then you kept saying, no, I can't be, it must be something that's, it's got to be done. I'm, I'm sure there must be a struggle there because I think of it as all these people wanted their loved one th things home and I think a lot of people more than others needed something solid of their family members because there are some family members that didn't even get their loved ones home so any piece you know we could have gotten back and we received my father's watch and it was still working and that was such a wonderful moment for my mom just to have something back and something hold and something to make it real and I'm sure it must have been so difficult 
to just try to sift through these personal belongings because they must have seemed so personal. But why do you think that you were able to keep up with it? You know, what was the emotion that had you go in there every day? My family's a long, long way from home. Your family was a long, long way from home. And if I could help and send some of the love we had in Lockerbie back with what we were doing, I would do it every day to help. That's all I can say. Before leaving Lockerbie to go home, Michelle wanted to spend some time in another of the sacred sites created for relatives. In the churchyard memorial at Tundergarth, she was able to reflect on the effect her journey had had on her. The hardest part of this is dealing with the enormity of the tragedy and the fact that he died with 269 other people. Looking back over the last 10 years and thinking about all the friendships that have been formed and, and the love that's been shared, it's comforting to know that out of something so evil, so much good has come. And in some ways, now I find comfort in the fact that he didn't die alone. There's always a tendency when a disaster happens, like Lockerbie or any other disaster, to say, well, good comes out of it. And fair enough, a great deal of good has come out of Lockerbie and wonderful friendships. And people have learned a lot about themselves. And there are friendships which will persist until we die. An awful lot of good. But at the same time, I always feel that it's a bit false to say, here's all this good come out of Lockerbie. So we can put that against all the bad that came out at the time, all the deaths, and say, that's fine, the books are balanced. The books are never balanced. I'd rather lock it had never happened. I very much appreciate the Chula family in my life and Jerry Booster in my life and so many other people in my life. I really appreciate that. It's a great blessing. But I feel that, you know, given the choice, they would rather Frank than me. And I would rather they had Frank than me. I guess I had hoped to find some sense of resolution from the trip, but instead I've come home and, and become even more obsessed by wanting to know further details of the crash. I'm thinking a lot about the fact that it has been 10 years since this all happened. And I'm horrified that after all the dedication of the Scottish police, after all the love and care shown by the people of Lockerbie, that there is still no resolution. I mean, it, it feels like an insult that despite all these efforts, the case has still not come to trial. Now I feel that until that happens, there can never be an end to the story of Lockerbie.